On August 5th, 1864, right behind me, the Union and the Confederacy fought the Battle of Mobile Bay. You may have heard the story of Admiral David Farragut charging through, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, and he sailed into Mobile Bay. Uh, and most historians have studied this battle kind of through that lens, through a military historiography focused on the order of battle, the technology like the ironclads, and the leadership decisions of top-down historiography. But that doesn't tell the whole story. You gotta recognize some of the less quantifiable uh, variables that affect the outcome of a battle like this, such as morale, experience, and organization. In the case of the Battle of Mobile Bay, it's important to recognize the vast difference between the Union and the Confederacy in the way uh, they used joint operations. So the intent of this dissertation is to prove that by 1864, the Union had gained proficiency in joint operations, while the Confederacy had not, and that difference had a big impact on the outcome of the battle. As of yet, there's been no coverage comparing the Union and Confederacy's proficiency in joint operations, at least in this battle. Uh, so viewing the campaign from this angle prompts historians to avoid looking at a battle or a campaign as a standalone event. You need to look at a battle as a uh, part of a sequence or a storyboard in the evolution of a fighting unit. The Union showed up to this battle, remember this is 1864, with years of experience, lessons learned, relationships built, and hindsight that they brought to bear in that battle. The popular historiography of Mobile Bay has gone through about three major shifts. Um, the first wave of historical coverage was uh, mostly from the 1870s to the 1960s, and it focused almost exclusively on a top-down military historiography. You know, what did the general say? Where was the second division? What was the order of battle? Uh, remember in the, in the beginning, uh, 1870s, the big historians, Frederick Jackson Turner, George Bancroft, they all viewed history through the lens of politics and great men. The publications included compilations of official reports, personal memoirs of the leaders, interviews of the leaders. Uh, examples are the official records of the Army, official records of the Navy, the biography of David Farragut by his son, C.C. Andrews' History of the Campaign of Mobile, Battles and Leaders of the Civil War, and The Battle of Mobile Bay by Foxhall Parker. Also magazines like the Confederate Veteran Magazine and Southern Historical Society papers. These books and magazines all focused on the leaders and kind of had that lost cause tone to it. While most of the historiography of this time was orthodox and romantic, there were other historiographies. Uh, the progressives were on the scene. They didn't overtake popularity of the orthodox, but they're around like W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, The Souls of Black Folk. He focuses on racial historiography. Also, the Journal of Negro History was around, and in 1919, they published an article on the blacks who dug the Confederate trenches around Mobile in preparation for this battle. Now, the, the first big shift happened right around the 1950s and 60s. Uh, the revisionist school gained a foothold. They Once again, they didn't overtake the orthodox view, but uh, they, they gained some popularity. The children and grandchildren of the veterans of the Civil War were now interested in why the veterans fought the Civil War. And so you see that debate begin over economics, states' rights, slavery, uh, and other reasons for the Civil War. You see economic historiography in James Hudson's 1960 book, Red River Campaign, Politics and Cotton in the Civil War, as well as uh, Francis Walter's 1952 article in the Alabama Quarterly about the economic reasons why the North decided to attack Mobile. You also have authors such as Arthur Bergeron's Confederate Mobile, and it brings something new to the discussion with this new wave of historiography by looking at civilian life in Mobile, as well as uh, he adds a few chapters on the role of African Americans in the defense of Mobile. The third shift in historiography comes in the early 2000s, and the historiography kind of branches out in several different directions. Some historians focus on the experience of the common soldier uh, in the African American experience. Sean Michael O'Brien's Last Stand of the Confederacy and Jack Friend's West Men Flood Tide describe how the soldiers lived, what they ate, uh, their hardships and their reasons for fighting. And O'Brien even includes some coverage on the black regiments in the campaign. 
Now finally, in the past 10 years, the most popular coverage of the Battle of Mobile Bay has revolved around civilian life during the battle and during the following siege, and also uh, racial historiography. Paula Webb's Mobile Under Siege, Russell Blunt's Besieged, Paul Bruski's The Last Siege, these all focus on the civilian experience. And interestingly, all these authors are local mobilians, and they rely heavily on private journals and archives that you wouldn't find uh, digitally. And local mobilians have also gained a high interest in the black regiments in the Civil War uh, down here, especially since we found the Clotilda, the slave ship, just up here in the Delta. So in conclusion, historians have thoroughly mined the top-down historiography of the battle. Local historians have covered the, the civilian aspect. Authors like Jack Friend have covered the common soldier aspect. And there's also been coverage on the racial historiography. But the gaps are still in the religious side and comparing this battle with the other battles of the Civil War. And that comparison is what I'll be focusing on the gap I hope to fill.